Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Forest Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging onto our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. someone at the gym just said, oh my gosh, somebody, a plane crashed into the Twin Towers, and then, oh my gosh, another plane crashed into the Twin Towers, and you knew immediately that something big was going on. And I remember at that point, I worked for, for HealthNet, and, and I went to the offices, and we, we had a 17-floor, 17 uh, 17-story building in Woodland Hills, and I went to the offices, and it was just sheer chaos, you know, imagine thousands of employees in there, people were just running out of the building. Number one, they thought for some of them reason, and I'm not being funny, they thought that 
of all the buildings and places that terrorists would hit in, in America, they all seem to think that the terrorists are going to hit the health net building. And I would say, no, it's not the terrorists are going to hit us, it's going to be our customers that hit us. But it's okay there. But, but just, they, they, wanted to, they wanted to go to the, the schools and get their children. They, they, they were saying, we're at war, we're at war, we're at war. And, and because our CEO at that time, she was actually in New York, she was stuck in New York, she put me in charge, I was a CEO at that time. And I had to do just a, a really eerie thing, and that was I had to walk all 17 floors and make sure there was nobody else left in the building. It wasn't that we closed the offices that day because we didn't think it was appropriate to be uh, open. We closed the offices because we didn't have any employees. And it was just really eerie walking through that very quiet, very large building and not have anybody in there with us. And, and the whole time just wondering what on earth is happening? What, what is going on? And I even remember for Janine and I, Ryder wasn't born at that time, but, but Jordan was very little. And even that night, I, I told Janine, I, I want Jordan to sleep with us. I don't know why, but you just, you wanted to have people around you. You, you wanted, you, you were trying to make sense of everything. You know, I, I said, we, we kind of went through the, the four R's. We were trying to reassess what was going on, and, and we, we tried to reprioritize what was really important in our lives, and, and reevaluate, and, and realign, and, and all these things, and, and we, none of it was making sense. We went to a church service that night, and, and one of the pastors got up, and he was angry. He was angry at the terrorists. He was angry at what happened to our country. And you saw a lot of people rose up, and, and there was this very strong uh, patriotic feeling. You couldn't buy a flag. You could not buy American flags because they were all bought, bought out. You know, there was a back order of American flags, and, and people were telling each other, you know, I love you, and, and, and you know, people went back to church because they were trying to understand what was going on, and, and it was so powerful and so moving that, that out of something so horrible, good can actually come out of it. Now you may wonder why on earth I'm talking about 9-11 when we're here to celebrate a Jewish festival. Well, Rosh Hashanah is kind of the same thing for the Jewish people. It's that time once a year as they get ready to celebrate their new year that they get a chance to kind of do the four hours as well, which is they try to reassess their life, reprioritize their life, realign their life for the new year. What's important to them? Where are areas that they can improve? They, there's this reconnection with family, as Jamie said, there's this community is really important. There's this reconnection with family. See, it's getting ready for the new year, knowing that something big is about to happen in their lives, and knowing that their lives will never be the same. And I'm sure for all of you, you would say the same thing. 9-11, our lives were never the same. People wanted everything to go back to normal, and, and yes, they went back to normal, but they will never be the same. I read some quotes from people and it said, I realize life can never be taken for granted. Quotes regarding 9-11, right after 9-11. Another one said, my eyes were open to the cruel, scary world that existed outside the safety of my small town that day. Being in only the sixth grade, I felt like a huge chunk of my innocence was taken by the terrorists. Another person from the Philippines wrote, it was a reminder that we should not wait to say, I love you, to our loved ones. And another person said, I found myself examining what freedom really means to me. 9-11 changed our lives forever. And this Jewish holiday or this Jewish festival is a time for the Jewish people that changes their lives forever as well. As Jamie said, this is actually a celebration of the, the Jewish New Year. And then when you look at Rosh Hashanah, that interprets the head of the year, the beginning of the year. It's the first of the high holidays, hol holidays, the first of the, they're really holy, first of the high holidays for the Jewish people. And over the next 10 days, they spend this time in prayer and repentance, and it accumulates on Yom Kippur, which is 10 days from now, the Day of Atonement. But during this time, they are preparing and they are getting ready. And to put things in perspective for you, you know, kind of the, 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 the high holy days for the Christian religion is from kind of Christmas to Easter, right? You have, you have Christians that are CEOs, Christmas and Easter only type things. Well, some Jewish people like that as well. They may only go to temple two times a year. It will be for Rosh Hashanah and for Yom Kippur. And what's interesting is Jewish people don't really need you to know a lot about their religion. They don't need you to know a lot about their festivals because for us, they don't even know a lot maybe about some of the festivals. But Jewish people expect everybody to know a little bit about these two festivals that they celebrate. 
Now, how many of us can actually say we know anything about these festivals? I don't know much. I don't even know when they are. We're going to get to that as to explain that a little. But it's first talked about in Leviticus 23, verse 24, where it says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of the trumpets, a holy convocation. So this is known also as the festival of trumpets. And then actually in Numbers 29, it's on your scripture right there, 29 verses 1 through 6, it talks about the feast of trumpets. Now I told you, I don't know exactly when these festivals occur because they occur at different times each year. It's not like Christmas or Easter for us. Well, Easter is a little bit different, but it's not like Christmas where it happens on the same day every year. The Jewish festivals occur, occur according to the Jewish calendar, which is different than the Christian calendar. In fact, the Jewish calendar um, it loses about 11 days relative to the solar calendar because they base their calendar not on the sun, but on the moon. So what the Jewish people do is because each, each year they lose days, so to speak, on our calendar. Every couple years or so, they'll add another month or two into their calendar to kind of keep in sync with the things. So, so normally, Rosh Hashanah occurs around this time, but it's never on the same date, and it's never necessarily in the same month. Same with Yom Kippur. It will change. Same with Hanukkah. So they will, what they'll do is basically, because they're based upon a lunar calendar, they will add in some time to kind of keep the task with ours. And they're not actually the only um, faith or, or religion that does that. The Chinese calendar is the same way as the Hebrew calendar. They based upon the moon, and so they have to add months in to kind of keep the track of stuff. The Muslims are the same way. Their calendar is based upon the moon, but they do not add in months. That's why they have their festivals kind of all around the, the uh, any time during the year. It's just, it's whatever. The Jewish people, at least, the, their calendar tries to make sure that it's done about within the same time. For 2015, Yom Kippur begins today. And it runs for the next two days, and it ends on Tuesday, September 15th. And it's not a big party or celebration like we think of for our New Year's, you know, where we count down the clock, and we celebrate, and we sing Happy New Year's, and we blow the, the things, and, and, you know, whatever. It's not that type of celebration. This is a time of reflection for them. It's a time of preparing for the year to come. And it started with the, the blowing of the shofar. And if you think about it, the shofar is a pretty significant and important piece within the Jewish religion. It was the shofar that was blown when Moses brought down the Torah, the uh, Torah, I almost said the Torah, Torah no, like the Torah from Mount Sinai. And if you remember Jericho, when, when Joshua was walking around Jericho, it was the shofar that they were blowing that time. So it's a pretty significant and important piece of Jewish history. And by the blowing of the shofar, it is telling people that they, are, they must come into service, they must be prepared and be ready. And throughout the service, as I said, they blow this horn like a hundred, at least a hundred times. And every day during this, this ten days, they will blow that horn as a reminder to them. And while we have some great food here, the traditional food that the Jewish people eat during this time is a round-shaped piece of bread called a shah, which symbolizes a crown, and it's a reminder of God's kingship. Now, they may do a couple of things that are a little bit different to that. One is they may actually build a ladder on top of it made of bread, and it's a reminder that God decides who climbs up and down the ladder of life. And as we're going to learn about, a lot of this this festival and a lot of the, the reflection that goes on during this time has to do with the book of life, the letter of life. That sometimes they actually will make the bread in the form of a bird. And that's because in the, um, the Torah it says that God will protect Jerusalem in the same way a bird hovers. Jamie was right. They love sweets at this time. One of their favorite dishes is they'll take apples and they'll dip it in honey. And it's to symbolize the hope for a sweet year ahead. Some Jews in the Mediterranean and the Middle East actually would eat a whole fish during this time as well. A wish for prosperity, fertility, and good luck. Other Jews will actually have present to their synagogue a basket of fruit, but cover it to symbolize that we don't know what the new year has in store for us. And then some families will actually enjoy a pomegranate for their meal during this time. And the thought behind that is that this number of seeds in the pomegranate reflects the number of good deeds they will do in the coming year. So you can see, even though there are some very um, rigid requirements, there are some kind of 
uh, variances with it. For the most part, Jewish people will actually celebrate this festival over two days, but some, um, some Jewish people will actually only celebrate it one day, which would be on, on uh, this, the, the Sunday here. The Torah reading for Rosh Hashanah comes from actually Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. And that's what we're actually going to be looking at today. And it's called the Binding of Isaac. And as they do this reading, they actually um, they reflect upon what Abraham and Isaac are called to do by God and what we are all called to do by God as well. So because it's a long verse, I'm not going to ask you all to read with me, but if you wouldn't mind, if you would please stand up. If you don't have your Bibles, I do have the scripture here on the handout for you. If you don't have the handout, please raise your hand and we will get your handout. But beginning in verse, uh, Genesis 22, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took his two, uh, two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood, of the, the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by, by, its, thorn, by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. And the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord came to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. You can go ahead and have a seat here. Now, for those of you that might not be familiar with the story of Abraham, Abraham and his wife Sarah had long wanted a son, and God had actually promised him that his descendants would bless and they would multiply. And Abraham, who was very old, and his wife, who was very old, just honestly got to the point where they didn't even believe that that was possible anymore. But because God does hold his promises, God uh, made Sarah, his wife, pregnant, and they had a baby, Isaac. So picture being Abraham, you had waited so long, and, and back in Jewish tradition, as, as a husband, as a, as, a, as, a, as a couple, you were nothing without a male, without a son. So God gives them the son Isaac. And then God tells them, Abraham, to go up and sacrifice him. Imagine being Abraham. Would you listen to God? Would you say, oh, that can't be of God? Would we make excuses and reason? What would we do? Yet here in Genesis 22 it says, Abraham listened to God. Abraham followed his commands, and Abraham did what God had asked him to do. 
And at the very last minute, in verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. And as we read, the Lord himself provided a ram for the sacrifice in place of his son Isaac. And to some degree, this kind of built upon the theme that we were talking about last week. If you remember, we were talking about us personally being an offering to the Lord. But this is something different. God wasn't asking Abraham to offer himself to the Lord. Abraham was asked to offer something more near and dear to him. His son Isaac. We can talk about being an offering to God all we want. But it's this not just about being an offering personally. God wants us to offer everything else in our lives to Him as well. All those near, dear, special things that we love so much, God is asking us to give to Him. For Abraham, it was his son. In our lives, it might be something different. It might be a relationship that we know that is bad for us, but we just can't give up. It might be a habit that we have that we know is unhealthy and ungodly, but we know we just can't give it up. It might be a love we have for some material things in this world that we just can't give up. It might be a scheduling thing that prevents us from getting to church or prevents us from spending time with God that we just think, we God, we just can't give it up. I'll get back to you in a couple years. God didn't ask Abraham to sacrifice himself on that. God asked Abraham to sacrifice everything he had, his son Isaac, on that altar. So as we look at this time of preparing for um, this, this festival, these next ten days, and as God asked Abraham to, to offer up his son Isaac on the altar, I think it's a good time for us to ask the same question. What else? What else is there in our lives that we haven't offered up to God? What else in our lives have we not laid upon the altar as a sacrifice to God that we've been keeping to ourselves selfishly? That we have allowed to get between us and God? That we have allowed to get between our relationship between us and God? What else is it in your life? that prevents you from having an intimate relationship. You see, the reason why God put us on this earth was for one reason. He wants to have an intimate relationship. So as you look at this time, what else in your life is preventing you from having that intimate relationship? Now maybe for some of you, you're saying, well, gosh, I, I can't think of anything so there must not be anything. And you know, you might be right, but, but what is it that you think of when you wake up? What is it that you think about and you talk about all day? What is it that you think about before you go to bed? If it's something other than God, then that's your what else. It doesn't have to be drastic. It doesn't have to be major. It can be something little that's preventing you from sacrifice and offering everything to God at His altar. Verse 2, it says, Then he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Who or what? is really the king in your life. The story of Abraham and Isaac is a story of faith. But how is your faith? What is that what else in your life? Rosh Hashanah is about reflection, is about remembrance, is about reassignment, is about regathering. What else is there for you that is preventing you from doing it? 
In a lot of ways, this festival, this celebration is not a celebration at all, but for the Jewish people, it's about inspection. It's about checking themselves before their Lord to see what is it that's preventing them from having this intimate relationship with God. Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwelt. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God's given us a choice to choose. So what else are you choosing? Later in verse 9, he says, Then he came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said to him, See, so he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay a hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. During Rosh Hashanah, the, the, the day is the opening of the book of judgment of creation and all mankind. And during this time, the judgment upon people is quote-unquote pending. That's why for ten days, they spend time in prayer, repentance prayer, and asking God for blessing. It's the time that they reassess their sin, they confess their sin, because at the end of ten days, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, that, that book is closed and sealed. And they want to make sure that when that book is closed and sealed, that their name is written in the Book of Life, which is why when Jerry gave us that saying to say each other, that is, that is the hope, that is the prayer, not just for themselves, but that should be the hope and the prayer for everybody else. And I, I'm going to get off track for just a second because it's supposed to be later, but truth, that should be our hope and prayer for everybody. We should look at everybody, whether they be in this church, whether they be those sinners out there in the world, but our prayer should be to them, may you be written in the book of life. And everything we do as an individual should be to help other people get written in the book of life. So many times I think as Christians, we, we get on this mindset like, you know, I want my name in there and I pretty much don't care about anybody else. You ever heard that saying like, you know, people say, well, what's going to happen to so-and-so when you die? I'm like, well, I'm going to be dead, so I don't care. Too many times we take this very, sorry, this very selfish attitude towards things. I think what the Jewish people say during this festival is great, and I think we should say it every day, every day to everybody we know. Now, my prayer is that you will be in the book of life. My prayer is that I will see you in heaven. I don't care if you're nice to me. I don't care if you're mean to me. I don't care if you love Jesus. I don't care if you're an atheist. My prayer is that one day you will be in the book of life. Church, I think even if we don't say that to everybody, we need to live that for everybody every day. It's unfortunate that Jewish people just do it during the season. But what's more unfortunate to me is that we as Christians don't say it at all. I believe we can learn a lot from the Jewish people. And I challenge you as you walk out of here to look at people differently. I challenge you instead of looking at people like, oh my gosh, please don't let me... Please don't let me run it. It's like when you used to travel, like you, you fly southwest, right? You, always, you, know, you get on the plane early and you like to have the space. You, know, you, you think you've got it all, but like, there's only 50 people on the plane. I'm good. I should have a whole world to myself, right? And like, yeah, you know, it's working out good. And then those last people get on the plane, you're like, Lord, please, 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 please don't let them sit next to me, right? I think we need to look at people different than us. Instead of saying, they are such a pain, I don't want to deal with them, Lord, please make them walk away. Do something, you know, with lightning, whatever you gotta do, I just don't want to deal with them. I think when you be looking at them saying, what can I do today to help them get their name written in the book of life? If they're not a nice person, what can I do today to, to show them God's love that maybe will soften their heart? If they say mean things to me, what can I do today and say to them today that will change their opinion, not of me, but of my God? I think we need to look at it as a challenge, not as a defeat. I think God wants us to help others get their name written in the book of life. 
So as you walk out of here today, I challenge you to say that and act that and live that to everybody you know. Because I do believe that if we do that, if we live that out, there will be blessing that comes upon us because of it. Maybe not in this life, but in the other life. Could you imagine, you know, let's say you get to heaven. And, and you get there, and there's that clerk from the grocery store that was always just a really mean person that, you know, you never wanted to go on the line because they were just, they were just horrible. Can you imagine if you got to heaven and that person came up to you and said, thank you, because of you, I'm here. Wouldn't that be just like the greatest feeling in the world? I think we need to live out that same thing that the Jewish people. May your name be written, inscribed in the book of life. And may it be our goal in life to make sure that that name is written. So during this time with the Jewish people, they begin this 10-day um, festival, this 10-day period where they pray like the Dickens to make sure their name is in the book of life. So when the book gets sealed, that they're there and they don't have to, um, they don't have to worry about it. There's this funny show... Um, I think it's called Raising Hope. It's it's a funny comedy. I've never heard of it before. But um, it's this this family that's pretty dysfunctional. They're pretty crazy. And this grandma who's like half there. It's um, I can't remember her name. She's an old actress. She's hilarious. And and so she says, oh, um, I don't know, like they shocked her accidentally or something like she died for a little bit. And she's like, oh my gosh, I, I went to heaven. And you know, so but but I didn't expect it to be as hot as it was. Right? <laughs> See, church, we need to make sure we get people to the right now. But, but during this 10-day time, they actually call it the, uh, uh, the sukkah. That's your KKOT. I know I'm not doing justice to the Hebrew names, right? There's a reason why God made the Christian, not Jewish. But, but, but that's what they rely on, this time to get themselves in the book of life. And even though the Jewish people rely on this 10-day period, what they call the sukkah, we call our, our Savior, Jesus. They think this 10-day period of being good and praying is what's going to get them in the book of life. But as we believe and we know that it's Jesus and only Jesus that gets us in the book of life. And it's only Jesus' forgiveness for our sins that gets us there. Matthew 5.17 says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Jesus fulfills that requirement, that 10-day requirement, for us to be in the book of life. The Jewish life depends on whether or not that person makes the decision to make amends during the high holiday period. It's a key moment, the time to reflect on past mistakes, past sins, and resolve in front of God that they would not repeat them in the future. But our eternal life doesn't depend upon a high holiday. Our eternal life depends upon a high priest, Jesus Christ, and making amends with him. Now I put it on our Facebook page this week. Repentance without change means nothing. And I think too many times our definition of repentance is saying I'm sorry, but it doesn't go beyond that. The true definition of repentance means that not only are we sorry for what we've done, but we do everything within our effort to make changes to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Church, I'm not here saying that it will never happen again, but we work every second of every day to make sure that sin doesn't happen again in our lives. Repentance is about a change of heart and a change of mind before it's a change in action. Before we can change our actions, we must make the decision to make sure that never happens again in our lives. I can't tell you the number of times that people have come to me with addiction issues and they say, I want to, I want to be healed, I want to be clean, I don't want to live this life anymore. And, and we have a, a, a connection with Teen Challenge, which is a great Christian-based organization that does addictions, alcohol, chemical, you name it. So I'll tell these people, not a problem. I can get you into Teen Challenge tomorrow, free of charge, Christian-based, but you have to commit a year of your life to it. Not one has ever taken me up and down. 
but I can't tell you the number of excuses. I was like, well, I have to be there for my family. Well, okay, well, okay. see, to me, that is true repentance. True repentance comes when we decide to make a change. True repentance comes when we decide to call Teen Challenge and say, you know, I want to come in. True repentance comes when we decide that we're not going to let that sin overcome us and control our lives anymore. True repentance comes when we reach out for help to God and those around us. And if we want to be in the book of life, then our high priest, Jesus Christ, requires that we have true repentance. That we change our lives, we change our hearts, we change our minds, we change our attitudes, we change whatever it is in our life that is preventing us from having that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. As I said last week, 1 Corinthians 11 28, let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. Church, it's so important that we examine ourselves on a daily basis. And as you look at your lives, as, as we reflect, just as the Jewish people did upon our last year and upon the coming year, are you ready to lay down whatever it is in your life that is preventing you from having a relationship with Jesus Christ? Our lives should revolve around those things in our lives. Our lives should revolve around making sure that we are in the book of life. Luke 10, uh, 10 20 says, Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. May we live each day with the phrase, May you be inscribed and sealed in the book of life. The high holiday period for the Jewish people is a choice between life and death, righteousness and sin. And those who repent are on their way to be described and inscribed in the book of life. But for us, Jesus is the difference between life and death, righteousness and sin, forgiveness and condemnation. Our faith, if you will, comes down to forgiveness. And I tell people all the time, yes, God knows everything, but thankfully He forgets some things. The Bible tells us that the moment we repent, and ask for forgiveness. It is done. More importantly, in God's eyes, it is forgotten. And if we ask for forgiveness and repent, we are told here that we can rejoice that our names are recorded in heaven. As we look at this time, and as you look at your lives, what prayers of forgiveness do you need to pray today? And I can tell you from personal experience, that's one of the most difficult things we have to do. I don't know about you, but I used to play Monopoly when I was little, and I don't know what I was thinking. But you know, you, you get money, right? And I never wanted everybody to know how much money I had, so I would like hide it under the board. I don't know why I did that, because eventually all the money comes out, right? So I thought I was hiding something because I thought I'd, I'd get some advantage of it. Turns out I didn't hide anything. Turns out it didn't help me in any way. And that's the same thing with our sin. We may think we're hiding it from people around us, but we will never hide it from God. God knows everything. We may think that we're hiding our sin from people around us, but just like that money, at some point, it will come up back on top of the board. And people will see it. Now, we all know we have sin in our lives. The question is, what are we going to do with that sin? Genesis 22, verse 16 says, It said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my, my voice. When we withhold our sin from God, we miss out on His blessings. I think every day we should live out the four hours of our lives. We should reflect upon where we are and what's going on. 
We should remember how great God is for us and all the things that He's done for us. We should reassess where we're going. And we should always regather with family and those around us. We must live a life of forgiveness so we can live a life of blessing. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says, Through the Lord's mercy we are not consumed, because His compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Every morning, God's promises are new to us. Every morning, God's blessings are new to us. But it requires us to be open and honest with it requires an action on our part. So many times we live with the thought that, well, I don't even have to sing anything because God just forgives me. We have to repent. We have to change. We have to be honest. So that we can have God's blessing. One of the very important components of this time for the Jewish people is the Tashlich, T-S-H-L-I-C-H. A ceremony in which Jews go to a body of water, such as a river or a stream or ocean, to cast away their sins by symbolically tossing bread into the water. And it's this physical act that inspires us to remember our actions, right and wrong, and allows us to reassess and make changes. Now, I remember, I remember hearing Francis Chan have this great idea. You know Francis Chan is, right? He's an okay pastor. He's got a little small church. But, um, <laughs> But he had this great idea that he was going to hand out pieces of paper to everybody. And they were going to write their sin on this piece of paper. And then symbolically, they were going to go to the bathrooms at the church and they were going to flush it down the toilet. Because, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people like you may tell people, I want you to write down your sin and come handle it on the cross, right? People like, I ain't writing down my sin because I know the pastor's going to look at the things after them, right? You can tell my writing, right? So like, I'm good. I don't need these sins. So Francis Chan thought, I'm going to have him flush it down the toilet so nobody will ever know what those sins are but God. Great idea until the toilet's backed up, right? So, you know, Francis Chan's like, praise God. And the, the guy who handles the facility like, man, I will shoot you when this is gone because there's water everywhere now. So, uh, so what they do is they use bread because nobody needs to know the sin but God, but they use this bread and they cast the bread into the water. It's symbolically saying I'm getting rid of my sin and my sin will be no more. Because what happens when bread is water? It's a sin of things. And that's what the Jewish people want to do during this time. They want to get rid of their sin. They want to start new, start fresh. They want to have a new year. And Jared, if you want to come on up, that's exactly what we're going to do here today. I know you're like, oh man, here it comes. He's going to read them. I don't know what I'm going to do. No, no, no. I promise you there's going to be no reading because there's going to be no writing. But if you look on your tables, there's a little cup with little pieces of black paper. There's no pen. There's no pencil. There's no writing that's going to go on. But these little pieces represent the sin in our lives. In church, can we just be honest that we all have sin in our lives? As Jared plays, this is our opportunity, just like the Jewish people, to cast our sins into the river. Although we don't have a river here, although in the new building would be cool if we had a little stream that ran through the building. But, but we have a, a trash can. So as Jared's plays worship, I, I want you to spend time in reflection. I want you to spend time examining. I want you to spend time with God and be honest, not with God, but be honest with yourself. See, God already knows it. We have to be honest with ourselves and others. The big ones and the little ones. And I want you to spend time in prayer. And, and, and if you feel called, and when you feel called, I want you to come up here. And I want you to bring your sin with you. And I want you to cast it into this lake to be gone forever. Remember what the Bible says, that when we, when, we, when we confess our sin to God, He casts it into the oceans, the depths of the ocean, never to be seen or heard from again. That's that forgiveness thing. Remember, God remembers and knows everything, but He forgets some things. This is, this is God's forgetfulness right here. 
This is our opportunity to start this new year, so to speak, clean and fresh. See, we get that every opportunity every day. Every day is really a new beginning, a new year for us. Now, I want to make you all feel good. Because I know you might be like, well, I'm not going up there. Because people may think, oh, well, they're all, yeah, I knew he was, he had issues, yeah. No, I want people to think I'm sin free. We are not sin free. But, but just to make you feel better, if I was going to be honest, which I am, I would have to dump the whole thing. I don't want you to feel embarrassed and ashamed, ashamed about not coming. This has nothing to do with you and anybody else here. It has to do with you and God. Whether it be a small sin or a big sin, God tells you to lay on his feet. They cast their sins into a river. We lay our sins at the foot of the cross. And that's why communion is so important to us, church. It's our opportunity to cast our sins to God that they will never be heard or seen from again. My prayer for all of us is that this is a new year for us, a new beginning today. Rosh Hashanah. A Jewish festival can be our celebration as well of a new life in Jesus Christ. They celebrate a hope we celebrate the same thing. So I don't want you worried about having to sing songs. And, and if you want, Jared, it's up to you. We don't even have to put the words up there because I want you to spend time. You know, this is kind of like communion, but instead of giving something, we're instead of getting something, we're giving something. We're giving Jesus our sins right now. And, and I did it to you. Know, you only have to throw one in there. You don't have to, that was just kind of symbolic for me. Like, I just want you to know that. That nobody's perfect. I, I heard a pastor once say that, you know, he was talking about the thank you man. He said, just so we're clear, I've broken everyone at least twice. I think you all could say that. But what is it in your life right now? What else? What else is it that God is asking you to lay on that altar so he can sacrifice it for you? So that you can receive all the blessing that he wants to give you. What is it in your life? In church, I believe that we I believe that we all have that. What is it? What is it right now? that God so desperately wants you to give Him that you've been unwilling to give Him? What is it right now that God has been so desperately fighting to take away from you but you have been so desperately fighting to keep? Spend time in prayer. And when you're ready, I invite you to come and cast your sin into our lake. And if you want, if you need prayer, we'll be back praying for you. This is our opportunity to start have a new celebration. And in 10 days, next week, when we come back to celebrate Yom Kippur, we won't have to worry because we will know that that hope of life has already been sealed. And thank you, Jesus, our name is already in it. So we don't have to spend the next 10 days hoping and praying. We can spend the next 10 days celebrating and rejoicing that Jesus, through His blood, put our name in that book. So church, I invite you today to celebrate with me what the blood of Jesus truly means to all of us. Oh,
I don't really pay attention because I was praying for people. But I, but I believe that God wanted me to let somebody out there right now that that, that maybe you, you didn't come and you, you didn't offer your sin at the altar for God. Maybe you just you were afraid to. Maybe you're not ready to. Maybe maybe you're not sure if, if this is the right thing for you. I, I believe that God wants me to tell you right now that the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ is we don't have to wait for once a year to do this. That wherever you are at any time, you can offer up that sin to Jesus Christ. So I, I want you to know if you did not do it today, if you were not ready to do it, if you were afraid to do it, I want you to know that God is patiently waiting for you. And God will not stop seeking you. God will not stop chasing you. And one day He will find you. So don't feel like like this is your last moment. There is a trash can. There is a lake in front of you every morning, every day that you can cast your sin. Do not be afraid to do it. God knows who you are, and I believe that God wants me to tell you that you know who you are as well. And that opportunity doesn't end today. It will be with you. So don't be afraid to take advantage of it. So Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, Lord. We thank you that, that in place of festivals, Lord, that that you gave us a, a, a Savior to our Father. Lord, we thank you that we can rejoice in the freedom of Jesus Christ, Lord, not by our own doing. Lord, we thank you that we no longer rely on sacrifices because you made the sacrifice of our Father. Lord, we thank you that we can offer up our sin to you and they will be cast into the depths of the sea, never be heard or seen from again. Lord, may this be a new year and a new beginning for all of us today, Heavenly Father. Lord, may we walk out of here not worried about whether or not our name is in the book of life. May we walk out of here proclaiming that our name is in the book of life, Heavenly Father. And may you use us to reach others so that we may say to them, may your name be inscribed in the book of life. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful family. I thank you for their love, Lord. I thank you for their passion and desire to follow you and their commitment to you. May you bless them. May you provide for them. May you protect them. In Jesus' glory, we can ask you in mighty name we pray. Amen. Now, as Jamie said, this is a little bit different. Please don't feel like you have to run out. We hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a Foursquare Christian Church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626-914-3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you, and thank you for joining the journey.